So, hi again, everyone. I think we're going to continue with the lecturers, and I just want to very briefly introduce our lecturers today. Um, our first lecturer is going to be Sherman Khan. Sherman is a partner at uh, Meshoff, Brennan, Gilmer, Israelson, and Memorial. Uh, Sherman has more than 20 years of experience uh, with litigation and complex technological issues. It serves as counsel and arbitrator in international arbitration, uh, including subject matters such as patent and trademarks, uh, IT outsourcing, construction, mining, and commercial issues. Uh, I will also mention Sherman. I didn't know this, like he worked for five years also in Tokyo and he got some sort of title in Japanese that I'm not even gonna try to pronounce. Uh, so, registered. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, and he, he's gonna talk us about uh, data breach standard of care. And then we'll have a lecture by Grant Hanessian. Uh, Grant is an independent arbitrator uh, in New York, specializing in international investor state and complex commercial disputes. Uh, he has a wide range of expertise in uh, laws of civil law countries and common law countries, as well as public international law. He was a partner with Baker McKenzie for uh, 33 years, uh, co-head of the firm's international arbitration practice, international arbitration practice in North America, and head of the New York office litigation department. Uh, he's a fellow of the College of Commercial Arbitration uh, Arbitrators, and uh, he's an editor of the ICR Awards and Commentary, among many other things that, you know, you have his biography, and I encourage you to read it because it's really impressive. Uh, and both Sherman and Grant are arbitrators uh, at the AAA and ICDR rosters, and I will say that they are excellent arbitrators. I've had the chance to work together with them closely, and we're very grateful for uh, the, them devoting their time today to the lecture. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I give the floor to Sherman for the all. Hi, thank you. Um, so I, I thought that I would uh, just give you a little brief uh, overview of the standards of care that um, have been applied in the data breach context. Um, Um, okay, so the first thing that we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about the standard of care data breach is that data breach is ubiquitous. The question really isn't whether a data breach is going to happen, it's when and how severe it's going to be. There are hundreds of data breaches every month. Um, one example that I, I found was uh, the California Attorney General requires that data breaches affecting more than 500 California residents be reported to the AG's office. And they list them all on a website. And as of yesterday, there had already been 68 breaches reported to California between January 1 and February 1, which is probably the last day that they posted. And for, for, but for every breach that is reported, there are dozens or hundreds more that we don't know of. Some data breach uh, victim uh, Victims don't report. Some breaches, even if they're severe, don't involve personal data. I mean, you guys have an example of that. And, and some breaches, surprisingly, don't affect California. So there are way more breaches than you see on there. So when we're thinking about a data breach, one thing that we want to keep in mind is that there's a, actually a, a long life cycle to, to the, the data breach um, situation. And there are different stages at which uh, you have different things you need to think about in terms of what the party that is uh, involved in the data breach, the victim of the data breach or a potential victim of the data breach needs to do. The first thing is being prepared. And that's what, what we think about most of the time is technical safeguards like uh, encryption or firewalls or two-factor authentication access controls, but and also importantly, training of employees to make sure that they don't uh, do something stupid because most data breaches are, are not necessarily caused by 
hackers that get into a computer system and get access to everything, they're actually caused because somebody at the company gives the keys to the kingdom to the hacker in response to a message, a social, it could be a phishing message that pretends to be something. It could be somebody that calls them and creates a relationship and gets them to give them their password. It could be all sorts of different things, but then you, know, you can have all the technical security in the world, but if somebody gives it away, somebody can get in. The second stage uh, is monitoring, and that's, uh, did you test, do you know when something happens? Did, were you able to catch it in time? Then if an incident happens, you want to think about incident response. Did they do enough um, to figure out what the incident was? Um, did they respond appropriately? What, what is it that they did to um, deal with the problem? Then remediation. Did they look at whether the problem could be fixed with, with uh, some changes in technology or some training of employees or something else? Was there somebody that needed to be terminated because they did something wrong? That's another place where the standard of care will come in. Um, and finally, reporting. Do you have to tell other people about it? This is where the state uh, breach notification laws and all those uh, requirements for notifying people um, are, arise. But it's not always clear that you have to do that. So the, the, the standards that we're talking about arise primarily in the, in the area of personal data and privacy laws, um, but they aren't really um, limited to that because they provide a good example for um, other contexts. And there's, as you probably all know, there's a lot of regulation around protection of personal data. Most US states have breached notification statutes. The FTC in, undertakes lots of enforcement actions in this area. Plaintiffs' lawyers bring <laughs> class actions. And other countries uh, have a lot of laws and regulations that set out standards. And the famous, most famous one probably for everybody is the European uh, General Data Protection uh, Regulation, GDPR. So the standards that are established in this context um, are, are helpful to thinking, think, in thinking about data breach issues in the business context. And, what we see is that most courts approach data breach on, on a, most courts and regulators approach data breach on a negligence model based on a reasonable care standard. And there are different um, ways that courts think about that. Some will think about it in terms of a reasonable um, data security professional. Some of them look at it more in the overall context of what a business is. But it's always a, a reasonableness standard uh, in most cases. So the, the, the question then is, since we live in a dangerous world, since people are going to try to get the data, how much care is reasonable? And the, the regulators and the courts do take into account that even if you do everything perfectly, there can be a breach. That means that it's always going to be foreseeable that this might happen. The question is, how much energy do you have to devote to reduce the likelihood and severity of anything that might happen. So one, one place we can look for a standard of care is uh, the um, Federal Trade Commission and their investigations of um, privacy and data security issues. Most of those actions um, end with a consent order. So we really have um, the consent orders just say you'll have a reasonable data security program going forward and they give you some requirements of things to do. So they're not super helpful in establishing a standard of care. And it, but if you look at uh, the, the um, publications of the FTC, you can, you can get an idea of what their standard is. And the FTC enforces uh, the data security under Section 5 of the FTC Act which um, allows it to sanction conduct that's uh, deceptive or unfair. That's a very broad statute. It, deceptive um, means that it deceives somebody unfair um, is in, determined in the context. There's nothing specific. There's no specific regulation that they're enforcing, except in certain specified areas like uh, banking and finance. 
So the, the, again, the touchstone of their enforcement is reasonableness. They, in a statement um, that they uh, put out after, after their 50th data security settlement, they said the following, the touchstone of the commission's approach to data security is reasonableness. A company's data security measures must be reasonable and appropriate in light of the sensitivity and volume of consumer information, the size and complexity of the business, and the cost of available tools to improve security and reduce vulnerabilities. That, that's a standard that the FTC has applied uh, throughout its, um, its uh, enforcement activity. Another place that the FTC looks is um, the safeguards rule from the Graham Leach Bliley Act that applies to um, financial institutions of various kinds. That, that sets a standard where you, the company is required to develop, implement, and maintain a comprehensive information security program that contains administrative, technical, and physical safeguards that are appropriate to the size and complexity of the company, the nature and scope of its activities, and the sensitivity of the information at issue. Now, another approach is found in the California Consumer Privacy Act, so referred to as the CCPA. And that, that act, uh, which was um, put in place in 2020, uh, provides California consumers with a private right of action against companies that um, release unencrypted and unredacted personal information. And the standard there is where a business fails to implement and maintain reasonable security procedures and practices appropriate to the nature of the information. So where the FTC is looking at the type of business, is it a small business? What is the business doing? Are they making widgets or are they providing data security services? You would have a different standard for those different kinds of businesses. What, the, what California is focusing on is the type of information. Is this a, a very uh, um, sensitive information like health information about individuals since they're thinking about consumers? But you could analogize that to um, trade secrets in a business. You should do more if it's very if, if, if it's very secret. Finally, there's the uh, in in Europe the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, um, has a similar approach to that of the FTC. They say uh, taking into account the state of the art, the cost of implementation, and the nature, scope, and con context and purposes of processing, as well as the risk of varying likelihood and, ser and, and severity for the rights and freedoms of natural persons. The controller and processor shall implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure a level of security appropriate. If you look at that, it's kind of in, in European flowery language, but it's very similar to the FTC's standard that, that we discussed a little bit. So the bottom line is that whether a breach leads to liability is, based, is going to be based on the totality of the circumstances. There are some types of failures that in, in the environment that we're in are considered de facto negligent. Things like allowing what's called a SQL injection, that's a, having a database that is um, easily penetratable so that all the data can be pulled out of it. Or like that. that the regulators will find that automatically negligent act. Having insufficient encry encryption. Encryption gets better every year. You have to have this current standard of encryption. You can't just have uh, encryption from five years ago. And increasingly, um, the, the regulators are looking to see whether you have two-factor authentication. Um, if you don't know what two-factor authentication is, that you've probably used it because your bank requires it, et cetera. But it's essentially something that you have and something that you know. So your password is a thing that you, you know. A place where they send a code is the thing that you have. It's the, the your phone or a widget or something that you hold in your hand that you have to have in order to complete the process of getting into something. So if, if a hacker, for example, finds out your email password, and can set up a on the on the internet a copy of your mailbox. 
You can avoid that by having two-factor authentication in place because then they would, okay, I've got your password, but it's acting me for the second factor I don't have. Yeah. So now, for example, example uh, insurance companies are requiring businesses to attest that they have two-factor authentication in place before they'll provide insurance. But if there are no de facto failures, the analysis is going to be based on the totality of the circumstances. You have to look at all the factors that, that are in play. And again, the, the best security is worthless if you let the attacker in voluntarily. And that, that does happen all the time from phishing attacks, personal engineering, fraud, etc. And you want to look at employee training in that context. So that's my incredibly quick overview of um, data security um, standards of care. I'll take any questions and then I'll turn it over to Greg. Okay. Uh, Chairman, before you sit, <clears throat> the reasonableness standard, is that equally adopted by civil law as well as common law countries? Um, well, uh, you see in the, the GDPR that they have essentially a reasonable standard. Um, so I'm not an expert on all okay. civil law countries and what they might do um, in, in this context, but I, I think that um, the GDPR is a good example of the use of a reasonable standard. In this, uh... Is there any distinction with respect to the data that is taken? In other words, personal data as opposed to commercial? The, the cases that I'm talking about and the standards that I'm talking about are really all personal data. I think that the analogy to um, uh, non-personal data, say trade secrets or um, uh, business information uh, is, is pretty strong. Um, and similarly, the analogy to things like, um, say, the the parts of the um, UCC that address commercial instruments and who's liable for fraud in a commercial instrument would be relevant to this kind of um, analysis. And with that, we'll go to Greg. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, this will be a little later. Thanks to Rafa for asking the question. Uh, welcome to the this, to this place. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about, uh, about New York, actually, uh, and how standing what was put in the program. A, uh, New York's contributions to international arbitration. And one of these, you'll know, of course, the New York Convention is done to the UN. The second is the NIST contribution. So it was conceived in New York. Talk about that. Talk about both these things through the stories of, of two people. Who I knew somewhat, uh, um, Jerry Axon and Eric Burks. They both passed away recently. Jerry Axon passed away two weeks ago. Eric Burks passed away last summer. Um, um, but before that, before that, I know you all like advice about the competition. I'm interested in. So I have some advice. One piece of advice. It has to do with this cup. You go to Vienna. Actually, I have never been to Hong Kong. I don't know. If you've been to Hong Kong, do you know if there's cups in Hong Kong? In Vienna, in the beginning, you got a cup. And you got a t shirt. Mm -hmm. This is the cup. 
didn't call, I don't collect the t-shirts because they all seem to be medium. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife is single. Um, I did collect the cups. I did collect the cups. I've been going to the business now for more than 20 years. Sort of in a high cabinet in the kitchen. And then I came home from a trip once uh, a couple of years ago, just for the fun of it. And I noticed that the kitchen cabinets have all been, everything's been reorganized. So then I opened the, my cabinet, my this cups are, and they're all other stuff as we put it in this cabinet. I go to my wife and I said, well, Where are my cups? She said, well, they were all the same. <laughs> I don't know why you need all of these cups that are exactly the same. So I threw them out. <laughs> she kept two. And they are all the same, except the date is different, of course. So it was the very bottom. The sponsors didn't sponsors for the this. And the date is different. And that's it. And of course, she didn't, uh, she didn't look close to that. <laughs> it's not one of the better days on <laughs> My cups are things. So my advice is you go back 20 times, as maybe some of you will, you can get the cups. Safe place. <laughs> far away from any you know, partner, spouse, person that may not understand the significance of the cups. Uh, all right. So uh, I'm going to talk about these, these, these two people, Jerry Axe and, and Eric. Um, uh, Axon was a lifelong New Yorker. Uh, he was born in the Bronx. He lived most of his life uh, very close to the Metropolitan Museum on the Upper East Side. He was a consummate New Yorker. He loved restaurants, walking the streets. He was an incredibly curious fellow. Uh, graduated from NYU Law School in 1958, one, one month before the Approved by the General Assembly of the UN. He worked in private practice a short time, and then he went to work as a civil lawyer. Um, and ultimately became general counsel in order to about 10 years. When he joined the AAA, uh, the AAA did mostly labor arbitration, uh, construction, and some insurance. Uh, there was virtually no international arbitration. Uh, Arbitration courses at any Seven, only 17. I know that some of this I'm taking. I, I saw Jerry talks about his career many times. I actually watched one on a screen this morning. So some of this is directly from Jerry. There's a blank that's not correct. But according to Jerry, only 17, when he joined the AAA, only 17. States in the United States would enforce a written agreement. This is how much of an infancy arbitration was here. Two thirds of the states wouldn't even recognize it. So the New York Convention is done, but it's not ratified by the United States. Only a handful of state countries immediately ratified it. And some of them were in European countries. Others were all the Soviet states, uh, and they, you know, they had sort of an Eastern Bloc at the time, and um, they all ratified the treaty very quickly. So in the United States, there was, you know, what is international arbitration? What is arbitration? What is this thing all the Eastern Bloc countries seem to like? Uh, there was no action in the United States to ratify the treaty. You need two thirds of the of the U.S. Senate. Say anything about the dysfunction of American politics now, but uh, in the 1950s, and you know, it was a tricky thing to get the U.S. Senate to agree to something that the Eastern Bloc seemed so enthusiastic about. Um, so the U.S. State Department called together a small number of lawyers in arbitration, including including Jerry, and they they worked out a strategy to begin that 
Constitution of the United States. And a lot of that involved reaching out to bar associations, reaching out to state legislatures, which didn't have an arbitration provision to, to adopt uh, some kind of uh, domestic arbitration law, the Arbitration Act, which began to be adopted in the United States, uh, talking to senators. And then finally, in 1970, 12 years later, the Senate, U.S. Senate uh, ratified Jury um, Acts, and, and it was one of the lead drafters of Chapter 2 of the Federal Arbitration Act, which, uh, which enacts the New York Convention. It's law. Even in 1970, there were fewer than 50 state parties to the New York Convention. Um, Axon started teaching at NYU in 1970, and what he says is the first international arbitration course in the United States. Um, now, I had have my assistant look into this, uh, and she reports that there are now 112 LLM programs in the United States. And more than 32, she says, are in the United States. And there are several in the North States, including Florida and Long Beach. Um, one of Axon's very early students at NYU was Albert Don Vanderbilt. Axon incurred. Study the New York Convention and maybe write about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's made quite a career. Uh, also, because because Axon was one of the, the evangelists for the New York Convention, international arbitration, and and because the Soviet ratified very early, Axon was one of the few Americans. Was actually actively in touch with lawyers in, his, in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, um, particularly a fellow named Sergei, Sergei Lebedev. Um, anybody in the room heard of Lebedev? Yes, okay, <laughs> um, And uh, well, quite a course by his own leading figure in academic in, in, in Russia and evangelist in international arbitration in Russia, and he and and became friends, and, and Axon got to know a lot of people actually in the Eastern Bloc. Um, and at, the, at this time, in the 60s and 70s, American energy companies were starting to be interested in, in Russia's oil and gas. Um, and the Soviets were interested in having this explored. And, but there was a, an issue about how to resolve disputes, right? Western. Companies were not interested in Soviet courts, and the Soviet Union was much interested in their courts. So, okay, arbitration. But, but where? And uh, Western companies thought Switzerland would be a good place. The Soviets wanted Stockholm. Why Stockholm? According to Jerry, it's because uh, this is during the Vietnam. And Sweden had withdrawn its ambassador to the United States, protest over the conduct of the war. So the Russians thought, okay, well, Swedes don't like America, so this would be a good place for us, a good neutral place for us. Anybody here from Sweden? Mm -hmm. Denmark, okay, all right. All right. So um, the State Department says to, to Jerry, well, what do you think of Sweden? And Jerry says, well, I've never been there. I'll go. So he, he takes a trip to Sweden. He talks to their arbitration people there and uh, spends a couple of days there. And he reports back, and what he said was a very short message. He said, Sweden is great. <laughs> Everybody speaks English. Everybody loves Americans. Maybe they don't like the government, but they like me. <laughs> and uh, they don't like Russians, from what I've been able to say. And they certainly don't like the Soviet system. So Sweden would be great. Last 50 years, Sweden has developed a real reputation as an East West uh, arbitration site, which continues to this day in China's final law. Um, Jerry sat uh, as an arbitrator in 32 different countries. Um, and when I started my arbitration in 1986, when I started with Baker McKenzie. I was 12 years old. <laughs> uh, and uh, Jerry was, was clearly the dean of arbitration.
portion of the United States. There were very few people in the United States. Um, and he was somebody who was very, very easy to talk to, very accessible. You could always call him up and ask him something. So in the late 80s, 90s, a whole series of events um, took place which have really resulted in this fantastic development of international arbitration in the lower part of the And I sort of have five of these um, that I want to just put on the table very quickly. The first of these, uh, at least in my way of looking at it, were the the, the Iran-U.S. claims tribunal, uh, which Iran Revolution, 1979, the tribunal was created in 81 to resolve cases of American companies uh, against Iran and the Iranian government against the United States. This, um, the Iran tribunal used the UNCTRAL rules, the ad hoc UNCTRAL rules, which had been created in 1976, but this was the first widespread use of these rules, and it opened up international arbitration to hundreds lawyers who hadn't done this before. So it and 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 they were operated you know sort of a civil law way by the US we were playing by Iran sort of leading law more civil law jurisdictions and they operated these sort of in a civil law way they weren't much interested in fact witnesses the hearings were very Two or three days sometimes for what was very large, not very large case. Second factor was that this was a time of, of real economic and political change. There were three more falls in the Soviet Union collapses, um, China's economy opens up, a lot of changes in Latin America, it's fade, and investment. Provisions. Uh, ICSID was created, of course, in 1965. It was in the 1990s, a lot of the NPOTs. And then the, the third thing is you begin to have national infrastructure which is there were in the, the US states at the time of the New York Convention, they even had an option. This was basically true throughout the, most of the world. Of the 1990s. The Estrell Model Law was 1985. It wasn't really until the 1990s that countries began to adapt it. Adapt it um, Russia in 93, China in 94, India Brazil in 96, uh, Mexico in 93. If you look at the, the when these countries uh, adopted this Estrell Model Law, some, some version of it, it's just the beginning of your own life. And then with the national institutions and national laws, the ICDR was created in 1996. Not exactly the, the AAA first published international rules only in 94. And the ICDR was created in 1996. Um, fourth thing was the internet. It's really hard for people to understand the changes that the internet made started doing this in the 1980s. Um, it wasn't easy to get materials. You know, uh, there were big university libraries uh, and there were a couple of law firms, one of which was my firm, that actually had international arbitration materials in the United States. There were very few firms that had an international arbitration. Uh, the internet changed everything. And this concept of a club, a small number of people, it's much more available. This Monday, I was talking to the chairman, Steve. Steve just pointed to a case and he said, Oh, I see you had a very similar case on this Monday. <laughs> this, never, this could not have happened even, even 10 years ago. 
Uh, and then the fifth thing is the VIS. Uh, uh, first VIS was held in 1994, and then it was about the same time in the 1990s. But the idea for the VIS was created in the early, I still have a mug uh, from 2006. I said there were two that I. So the two would survive my wife's destruction of <laughs> my collection. So the 1990s, the early mugs all said Pace, Pace University, uh, administered by Pace University. Uh, the later ones don't have Pace on. Pace, Pace is in Westchester County, which is immediately to the north. Uh, why Pace? How Pace? Uh, and why? Well, please, uh, who, who is this fellow? What is, what is this? Uh, where is the logo? So, um, all of this was uh, teaching the case after a time. Uh, that's a, he had met the secretary of Lonsa Trump. He was Dutch. Uh, he worked in the union for Lonsa Trump. He retired from Lonsa Trump. He went to teach at Pace. He had this international uh, institute. And Eric Bergstrom, who followed him at Lonsa Trump, the secretary of Lonsa Trump, in New York. I got to know uh, Eric Bergstrom a little bit when he was here in New York. He was at Ancetral. Um, but and then Ancetral moved to Vienna. He moved to Vienna. He finished out his career there. Bergstrom had, who was actually an American, his father was a uh, Swedish. Um, at Ancetral, he was principally responsible for the New UN Convention on Contracts with Sale of goods, so ASG, uh, foundation of this project. Substantively, it's ASG, procedurally, national arbitration. Uh, so then, when he retired from Unsetral, then he joined this faculty for doing this. And together, together, they conceived of this competition. Um, they initially talked to the New York City Bar Association about hosting this, but ultimately, in part because Unstral is now in Vienna, they both had these ties to Vienna. The wife was Viennese. They decided, and because most of the people doing this were in Europe, how did that work? They decided that the competition itself would be in Vienna. So, um, and this, and then, and then, it's not. Died. After they conceived of this, and we're setting it up first for the first competition. So we're to name it after his, his, his partner there at the law school. And this ship was, a, was actually the logo that was used at this Pace Institute for the work today. Right? It's some kind of touch sailing ship. That's, that's how all this happened. It happened here. Yeah. Um, the first year, they had there were eleven. Uh, they were mostly in Europe, but there's also a team from U.S., Canada, and Australia. And most recently, the this had 380, 89 different countries. Eric, uh, as I may have said, Eric used to come to Baker McKenzie seminars. We had seminars in the, in the 80s and 90s on international arbitration. In a lot of cases, not this claims tribunal or results of international arbitration. Expertise in this. So he's dead. Now there are seminars on, on international arbitration around the clock, it seems like. It's been all your time. At the time, there were very few of these, and Eric used to come to ours and hang out. And, when he would speak, and uh, it's really great to know him. He never really liked the idea of the best competition because that just wasn't his nature. He was an incredibly generous, warm, but he needed the cooperation of law schools, and law schools like competition. <laughs> They like they like teams. They like winners. It's a way to raise money. Well, of course, it's a competition. 
as I've just said, the 319 to thousands of people who can invest in dark seeds and raw apple industries during the competition phase. It's really quite inspiring. And the diversity of these teams is just amazing. Just amazing. We started going. Story before the first time I went to the library late from the US, and I, I barely got there in time. The chair seat open for me until I arrived. And there was a team uh, from India, and there was a team from a Chinese city I had never heard of. Oh, this competition is unbelievable. We can sustain this profession. Tens of thousands of people do this. I don't know what they know. I really do. Talk about the power of the body. I don't know what they know. It's all sustained. Eric was incredibly generous in terms of his evangelism. He always removes any institution that want to participate, have their name listed. That was fine. Any institution want to have a creamer, that was fine. It was, was a great testament to this idea that there's no limit to what you can do if you don't concern yourself with who gets credit. First 15 years of this, Eric did everything himself. Uh, so he's actually working harder in his retirement than uh, I see Charles when he was doing it. And of course, he wasn't paid for doing this. About 15 years ago, 2007, actually, a German entity was pronounced Austrian law entity was created, the Bismuth Association. Three directors. Uh, Seeing those who need to go to Vienna, Patricia Mental, Christopher Key, and Stefan Kroll. And you see these fantastic problems. <laughs> Eric was very much a presence uh, in the Juridicum last year. Thousands of students have got to the Juridicum over the years. Um, to sort of share his, his incredible. Spirit that he has, this was spirit. He, uh, 2022, he resigned, uh, succeeded by Patricia Shaughnessy, who uh, for many years ran the education program in Stockholm. Um, this, this spirit, which you'll hear a lot about uh, as you progress in the competition, uh, in my way of looking at it, sort of has two pieces. One, it's, it's about uh, promoting a more uniform approach. Uh, dispute resolution. Cultures, all parts of the world, looking at CISG substantively, referencing a little bit of international arbitration procedurally. But also, it sort of unites uh, students and coaches and arbitrators and practitioners all around. It's a kind of a sense of community to all of us and what we do. Connection. Uh, so many of you will learn about the Smooth Society. You learn and marriages that have come out of this experience, and babies that have this experience. So enjoy, enjoy the experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs>